Hello, so my name is Chris Lawley, and uh, today I'm going to talk about a relatively unusual uh, setting for gold mineralization. Uh, there's only a few case examples of the, the setting uh, worldwide, and what I'm going to be talking about is reworked Archean cratonic margins. So when, when I talk about Archean cratons, a lot of people think that these are stable continental blocks, and in fact that's the definition of what an Archean craton is. But what I'm going to argue today is that at the margins of those Archean cratons, you actually can rework them during younger orogenic events. And I'm going to argue that gold is related to that reworking. Oop, sorry. So my presentation is actually split into two parts. Um, the first part's going to be talking about the loop of gold field. And this is going to sort of summarize uh, some of my PhD work uh, in Tanzania. And I completed my PhD at Durham University. So a lot of it, uh, of this first part of the presentation, is going to be looking at reading mosmium geochronology. So one of the first things that you have to come to grips with when you work in Tanzania is the enormous knowledge gaps. Um, this is a geological map of Tanzania. Uh, it's, it hasn't really changed since 1959. Um, and so what um, you get uh, is this pink, big giant pink blob is the Tanzanian craton. And all of the yellow stuff are what is known are, as mobile belts. So these are, these are belts of deformed and metamorphosed rock. And so for the purpose of the presentation, we're going to be looking down here in this part of the yellow block uh, next to Lake Rukwa. Um, and this is part of the Ubendian belt. And so prior to our study, everyone thought that all of these rocks were high grade, and everyone thought that all of these rocks were Proterozoic in age. And so the reason for that is because the countrywide aeromagnetic map showed that the southern boundary of the Tanzanian craton was marked by this magnetic high. And so presumably that the, that was the, the kind of the limit of these Archean rocks. Obviously understanding uh, Understanding where this boundary is is really important if you want to trace. Uh, these, are, these are actually the major gold deposits in northern Tanzania that you probably are most familiar with. And so if you're interested in tracing these kind of well-endowed terrains into these younger metamorphic belts, you really want to understand where the limit of those metamorphic belts is. And so I kind of like this picture um, because it kind of sums, summarizes a lot of the geological field relationships that I saw in the field when I was out there mapping. And so what it is is, is a basically it's a granitic gneiss um, and we saw a lot of these, and they're always, they were consistently cut by these non-foliated granitic intrusions. And so the composition of these non-foliated intrusions range from granite diuretic to cyanogranites. And then, of course, most importantly, uh, these non-foliated granites were actually cut by the, the gold-bearing shear zones. And so one of the first things we obviously wanted to do was, okay, well, what is the age of these so that we can start constraining this early style of deformation? And so these are uh, some laser ablation ICPMS zircon ages that we got while collaborating with the British Geological Survey. And one of the really cool out uh, outcomes of this is that for these three granitic samples is that they were all Archean in age. So they ranged from 2.7. And then this one particular sample uh, actually had inherited zircon cores at about 2.85. And so these were really the first uranium-led zircon ages ever to, Archean ages ever to be reported for this part of Tanzania. <clears throat> So obviously we were really excited by these, and so we wanted to go one step further. So we t went to those spot, same Archean aged spots, and then we reanalyzed them uh, with the laser system for their lutetium hafnium composition. And so if you're unfamiliar with these plots, on the x-axis is the uranium lead zircon age, and on the y-axis is the hafnium composition of those same spots. And then I've got plotted here some reference lines, which are the mantle composition. And I think what the takeaway home from this is, is that all of, almost all of the granitic ice samples plot well below any of the expected mantle compositions and suggests that these granitic melts, yes, they're Archean, but they're actually re melting even older rocks that aren't exposed or that we haven't dated yet. And so this was really, really exciting because it allowed us to propose that the Tanzanian craton was actually much larger uh, than previously thought. It's about 150 kilometers. It can be extended at least 150 kilometers to where we were studying down here. And the other thing it suggested was that the Ubendian belts actually re is comprising reworked Archean crust, um, which was something that wasn't appreciated prior to this study. And so it's kind of become of interest now because what we're finding is that other people that are working north of where we were working are actually also getting these Archean ages. And so automatically we are changing the setting for these gold um, deposits that are located down here. And it's important because they also, these Archean rocks also host gold. And so in this picture, this is actually the largest colonial gold mine in the Lupa gold field. Um, at that time when this mine was operating, it was actually the second largest gold producer in Tanzania. So it was actually quite a significant mine at the time. And in the hanging wall of the deposit is a myelinatized Archean granitic gneiss. In the middle is a, a big quartz vein that's in the middle of this shear zone. And in the foot wall is a Proterozoic gabroic dike. And so this sort of 
what this, and so what we had to start doing was, okay, so there's our key in rocks, but then what is the timing of gold? And so to do that, we had to kind of bring together other methods. And so here is, is a, my geological map of the field area, so the scale's kind of hard to see, but it's about 30 kilometers across. And each of these black dots are some of the artisanal workings that I visited during my field area. The black lines are shear zones that we picked out from magnetic maps. Uh, the purple is the Archean granitic gneiss, and all these other colors are protozoic granites. And so what became very clear was that these artisanal workings, these illegal miners that are kind of have small scale mining operations, um, were kind of following um, these, these shear zones. And we can see these in a lot of their pits. So one of the consistent features that we kind of noticed was that uh, most of these pits were exploiting a myelinitic shear zone with a, with a quartz vein in the middle. And what they were really seemed to be concentrating their efforts on was actually the contact between the quartz vein and the shear zone. And that was something that we saw over and over again. So in this case, they've actually left most of the quartz vein, and then they've actually taken all this soft, gooey myelinitic shear zone. I, and I think part of that was because it's quite easy to, 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 to mine, quite frankly. But I also can't help but feel that they've actually got a, quite a bit of gold at the contact between these two um, rocks. And what was really cool was that in lots of pits, we were able to actually go from non-foliated granite, it progress into the shear zone, and so we were actually start to, we were actually really able to work out how these shear zones developed. And so what these guys would do, um, they used uh, steel rods to, to drill holes into the, into the rock. They'd load that with explosives, and then they'd light a fuse with batteries, and then they'd run up this rope um, before, uh, the, to get free of the blast. And then they'd use these improvised winch systems to get those, that rubbly rock up from, uh, from, from where they were working up to surface. Uh, in some cases, they would, they would crush the rock by hand with ro other rocks, diorites. In other cases, they had more kind of uh, advanced uh, means of crushing the rock, like this mill. And then they'd take that rock powder and in giant walks over an open fire as they'd actually uh, amalgamate the gold with mercury. And so this guy's holding a nice little gold uh, mercury ball. And what they were after with these rocks. So we'll just get back to the geology. So th th this is exactly the kind of material they were after. So here's the myelinic shear zone, and here's the quartz vein. And automatically, you can see how complicated these quartz veins are. And so what we have are, is a quartz vein that's kind of got, is, is laminated, and it's laminated by a myelinatized rock. And so these features uh, were kind of typical of uh, some of the, the quartz veins that have been described previously in Canada and elsewhere. Um, Sigma Mine's a good example for this. So you get these, at Sigma Mine, you get these uh, steeply dipping shear zones. Within the shear zones, you get these, uh, what they call fault fill veins, and then you also get these flat dipping extension veins. And we saw all of these sorts of uh, vein features in the deposits that, or the artisanal workings that we were working with. And so my idea was, uh, I really wanted to unravel this kind of hydrothermal and deformation history. And so the idea was, well, why not we sample the myelinitic shear zone, we date the, the shear zone, we date the, the vein that fills that shear zone, the fault fill vein, and then we date the extension veins. And so we tried to use these kind of gross diff different vein styles um, as a kind of records of instantaneous strain to reconstruct the hydrothermal and deformation history. And so this is one of these gold um, bearing shear zones. Um, and we can see that, the, that they're actually quite uh, pyrite rich. And so we became really, really interested uh, in the pyrite because we knew we could date it with rhenium osmium geochronology. Um, and so this is uh, one of these uh, shear zones in a CT scan. And so as it rotates, you're going to see that um, the green stuff is all the low-density minerals like quartz and phyllosilicates like chlorite. Um, and then the pink stuff are the pyrite crystals. And then if you look really carefully, uh, it, you'll see little white uh, blobs. And those are the most dense minerals like gold and galena. And so I did this not just because it looked kind of cool, but because I was actually really interested in the, if we were going to date the pyrite, it became very clear to understand what the relationship was between pyrite and the, and the myelinitic fabric. And so here's a still image of that CT scan. And what we could see was the same in three dimensions, though, was that the pyrite crystals, which are these red blobs, are enveloped by low-density minerals like quartz, and they're strain fringes. And we could actually see these things in three dimensions. Not only that, we could see that the pyrite was actually following both the S fabric and the C fabric within the CS myelinites. And so what, what we took these relationships to suggest was that not only is the pyrite associated with gold in some way and could kind of constrain the timing of gold, but that the pyrite also constrains some of the myelinitic fabric development. The quartz veins were also interesting in themselves. They're very complex, as I mentioned before. And so one of the cool things that we tried to do that was a bit different from previous studies, most previous studies would take a rock like this, they'd grind it up, and they'd separate all the millionite out as one. Um, these are actually, sorry, oops. I should mention that these little stylolite veins are actually filled with molybdenite. 
But our approach was slightly different. I wanted to kind of try to tear these things apart. And so what I did was I sought out individual stylolites and I separated them and then I dated them individually with the hope that each stylolite would record a different increment of strain. I was wrong, but um, I'll show that in a couple slides. <clears throat> And the same thing with pyrite. These aren't stylolites necessarily, but they're certainly uh, laminated uh, pyrite-rich stringers. And so I thought that if I dated each of one individually, we could kind of come up with, a, with, a, with a, a strain history. And then, of course, we also dated the extension veins, which uh, in this case at Porcupine are really, really clear. And they're all kind of these flat dipping veins that occur in a, in a steeply dipping panel of anostomizing an shear zones. So a lot of my work, a big portion of my PhD was actually in the lab, and so I spent a lot of time at Durham University uh, doing the Rini Mosmium geochronology. And what I noticed in a lot of geochronology talks, people just kind of speak about an age. But for me, the age is actually every, how you interpret the age is how you actually collect the age in the first place. And so I thought it'd be important just to kind of briefly discuss how we actually get these ages. And so I mentioned that I sep I'm separating out individual veins within a broader vein. And so what you need for rhenium osmium dating is actually about 300 milligrams of uh, sulfides. And the reason we need so much material is because these samples have very low rhenium. Um, so if you think about this, that back 20 years ago, Chris mentioned this this morning, if you took a pile of zircons about, tw about a tenth of this, this amount, you'd get geologically meaningless ages in some cases because you weren't at the spatial, these, these crystals record multiple histories. And so we're actually unable to kind of separate those histories out because it's a bulk separate technique. So just, this is a really important in my mind uh, to keep in mind when you interpret rhenium osmium ages. And so we take those samples, we throw them in these glass tubes, which are called carious tubes. We dissolve them in a reverse aqua regia. We put them in an oven for 48 hours and we, uh, we bake these things at 220 degrees um, at under pressure. And then we go through a series of wet chemical steps to separate out the rhenium from the osmium. So that's kind of like the underlying, the method uh, that, we, that kind of goes behind these ages, and I think that stuff's really important. And so here's uh, some rhenium osmium molybdenite eight model ages uh, for that, that big mine that we saw at the first slide. So this is the largest mine in the, in the area. And molybdenite's great. Um, it has lots of rhenium, so you don't need much sample material. And the other great thing about it is that it has almost no common osmium when it crystallizes. So you can calculate these model ages and have good confidence in them. And so here are a series of stylolites that I separated from those fault fill veins. And we can see is that they're all sort of overlap with an analytic uncertainty. Um, the other cool thing that I think we did, tried to do was we noticed that, okay, molybdenite's in these stylolites, but it's also disseminated as ultrafine crystals within this quartz vein matrix. And so these samples were actually impossible to separate using conventional techniques. So the idea was we need to kind of unravel these quartz veins, so we need to date these things separately because they might be unrelated to these stylolites. And it turns out when we dissolve the quartz vein and actually we were able to collect enough of this material, um, we could actually see that they, in fact, yes, the disseminated um, molybdenum is significantly older than the stylites within the same vein. And so what, for me, this is a really good example of how we can't just take a vein and separate everything out and date it all as one thing. If we're careful, we can actually unravel some of this history. At Porcupine, this is a sample myelinite from Porcupine where those extension veins are. Here's the myelinite, um, and the molybdenite occurs at that uh, myelinite contact in the, in the sulfidized uh, granite host rock. At Porcupine, we, get, we tried the same thing. We tried to date uh, molybdenite in these in stylolites and then ultra, ultra fine, and we got the ultra fine molybdenite. It seemed to be slightly older, but in general overlapped with an analytic uncertainty. And so for me, this is a good sign to say, yes, sometimes we can separate out these histories, but in general, the analytical uncertainty on molybdenite ages is such that we, we don't have the resolution that we need to break these things apart. The other thing that was clear to me was that we never saw molybdenite and gold together. And so it was never clear to me what these molybdenite ages meant in terms of the gold history. And so to do that, we turned to rhenium osmium pyrite dating. And so pyrite, um, one of the problems with pyrite is that one, it doesn't have, enough re doesn't have very much rhenium. So it has a few parts per billion rhenium generally. Um, which means you need a lot of it. And the second problem with pyrite is that nearly all of the osmium in, in, in pyrite is radiogenic. It's the radiogenic decay of, of rhenium. But this small slice of pi uh, of cosmon osmium is actually quite important. We need to measure that quite precisely. And at, the, at a few ppb rhenium, that means we've got a few ppt of total osmium, which means that this slice of pi is actually really, really small. It's so small that it overlaps with our analytical blank. And so what that means in real terms is that we can't measure it very well. And a consequence of that is that we get enormous analytical uncertainty ellipses 
And these ellipses are actually correlated because we have, the problem is we've got common osmium in the denominator of both of these isochron axes. And so you get these horrendous analytical uncertainty ellipses that kind of string up and down the isochron. And so if you imagine what we're trying to do here is actually fit a line between these data points. But because the, the uncertainty ellipses are stretched out, um, you can imagine that it's very difficult to fit a line with any degree of confidence. And so what we can do instead is actually reanalyze those with a different spike and treat them like molybdenite. So we kind of ignore the common osmium. And so that's what this plot shows. This is over 70 individual analyses, 70 model ages all in one plot. And so I'm going to just zoom in on uh, the Paleoproterozoic. <clears throat> and the purple are the pyrite ages, the yellow are the calcopyrite, and the blue is the molybdenite. And there's quite a bit we could, and they're for each of the five deposits. Um, I dated five different uh, samples from five different deposits. And I just want to bring up two things. Um, one, at Kengi, so that's the big deposit that I showed you the first slide, we can see, again, that the disseminated pyrite is slightly older than the stylolites. Um, but critically, the myelinitic shear zone that hosts those fault fill veins are actually much younger at 1880. And if we look, some of the pyrite and calcopyrite within those fault fill veins is the same age as the myelinite. And so what I think this is suggesting is that these systems have actually really, really long-lived histories, and they're really complicated. They go anywhere from 1950 to this kind of much younger event, uh, which appears to be the timing of myelinitization. The other major point that I want to point out is that um, there's a lot of slop. Um, if you go across, all of these are broadly equivalent, but if you looked at the geology of these veins, we know they're more complicated than that. And so what I think the rhenium osmium data is showing us is that the, the, the difficulties in actually getting these ages from these types of samples, these low rhenium samples, um, is, cause, is sort of, we can't resolve some of the questions that we want to answer, and so we have to turn to other isotopic techniques. And so I took this picture um, uh, as we were driving through Tanzania, and I've never had a start of the dangerous zone, so I didn't want to give you the start of the danger zone. Um, and so there's a few implications that I think that we can talk about with these ages. One, one of the things that strikes me is that, okay, so we've got these shear zones that have long-lived histories, but why do the shear zones seem to be reactivated than rather than making new shear zones? And so I think part of the answer is, in, uh, is, is, is recorded within the shear zones themselves. And so one of the things we started playing around with was, okay, we know that there's some really good go work going on now that we, in um, actual experiments where we, we, dis um, sorry, we deform myelinites, myelinites like this, and they're called phylonites because they're coarse-grained and they're full of phyllosilicate minerals. It turns out that these rocks have really low frictional coefficients, and so it's actually really, really easy to deform them. And so when we plot, when you do some modeling, um, what we see is that if we squeeze these things, it doesn't really matter what the orientation is. So that gray halo up there are all the orientations that would be reactivated for a shear zone like this. And it suggests, so what we can say is that it doesn't really matter what the orientation of the shear zone is, it will be reactivated if you've got a weak shear zone like this. And so I think that the, the interplay between the, the rheology of these shear zones, the fluid pressure, and, uh, and the stress and the strain are key factors in explaining why these shear zones are continually reactivated over great lengths of time. So they're long-term, long-lived zones of weakness. The other thing we can say is that these, um, <clears throat> these deposits that were in Tanzania are actually very different from the classic orogenic greenstone host deposits that kind of Groves talks about. At these deposits, um, they're hosted by accreted terrains, and generally the timing of gold mineralization is actually, it post-dates the host rocks, but only by maybe a few tens to hundreds of million years, whereas in this case, the, the timing of gold actually postdates the host rock by almost a billion years. So it's a very different, um, very different environment for gold than, uh, say, these orogenic, classic orogenic gold deposits. And so I was really lucky when I was hired by the GSC. Um, basically, I got to move on to another area where we see the same relationship. And so, Basically, with the PhD, we proposed that these, these gold deposits were hosted at a reworked Archean cratonic margin, and the other place in the world where we can see gold hosted at a reworked Archean cratonic margin is at Meliodine. So here's a map of the Western Churchill province, and just note the scale. This is absolutely uh, a, quite a large, large area, zoomed out photo. And what I've got plotted here are all the gold stars. So these are all the known gold occurrences in uh, the Western Churchill province. And what appears to me is that, first of all, these stars appear to be aligned, aligned lines. And the second thing that I notice is that they're also associated with the green stuff, which is our greenstone belts. And so what's kind of cool about this is that the Archean, these greenstone belts are all Archean in age, but all of the available data for these deposits, so at Meadowbank, at Meliodine, and at Three Bluffs, suggests 
that, these, that the gold is actually paleoproterozoic. So the gold story in the Western Churchill province is actually related to paleoproterozoic reworking of an Archean uh, province. And so this is some previously reported uranium-lead hydrothermal monazite ages at Meliodine. And the monazite actually occurs in the same microtextural setting as gold in these deposits. And it's dated at about 81.85 GA. And so here is the Meliodine Gold District. Um, these, these squares with numbers in them are the actual known gold deposits. And so, and the red stuff is BIF. And so what we see is that a lot of the gold deposits occur along what's known as the Pike Break. And then along the, not only do they occur along the Pike Break, they're actually hosted by these uh, banded iron formations. And so these are what uh, the ore, ore zones look like for uh, some of the deposits that I studied. And what I think, what this, one of the striking things for me is that these quartz veins, when the quartz veins cross cut the BIF, we get these halos of arsenopyrite forming at the edges of those quartz veins. And these quartz veins are also deformed, um, they're folded. And the other thing that I like to point out was that sometimes the quartz veins are actually hard to see. They actually seem to be more like silica flooding that truncates the BIF banding rather than true uh, nicely formed quartz veins. A big exception to that is at Terraganiac. So this is the main ore zone at Terraganiac, which is the largest deposit within the Melidine Gold District. And we can see that it has, shares a lot of the features that I saw in Tanzania in the sense that it's got slivers of myelinized rock um, and it's also associated with these flat dipping extension veins that are in turn folded within this overall shear zone. <clears throat> Gold at these deposits is really associated with the arsenopyrite, um, but it occurs at the margins of those arsenopyrite crystals and also fills fractures. The other common setting that we see for gold is that it occurs as clusters associated with recrystallized arsenopyrite. So in this case, arsenopyrite seems to be uh, recrystallized into magnetite, and it seems to have um, deposited quite a bit of uh, gold associated with that in, in clusters of inclusion. <clears throat> so one of the things that we wanted to try was we've got those monazite ages, but we wanted to kind of follow that up with samples that were, had better constraints uh, uh, with, this, these sul with this sulfide history. And so what we did was we dated xenotime from these samples that had clear uh, relationships with some of the sulfides. And one of the things I want to point out, here is a xenotime crystal wrapping arsenopyrite. And so that's the same relationship that we saw with the monazite. Monazite and xenotime appear later uh, than the arsenopyrite, but it seemed to occur in the same place as the gold. And they also have the same age as the monazite, so 1.86, 1.85. Um, but for me, those ages aren't really constraining the entire hydrothermal history because they're occurring at the margin. They kind of appear much later than the arsenopyrite themselves. And so what I wanted to do was bracket the timing of gold by dating the arsenopyrite and then dating the later hydrothermal monazite and xenotime. But what I learned from my PhD is that these sulfides are complicated. And so uh, at the Geological Survey of Canada, we've got uh, Simon Jackson has sort of come up with these uh, trace element mapping techniques similar to the, the codes technique. Um, except that we use a, a basically a thousands of thousands of individual spots within a, in a grid pattern. And we can see fascinating patterns that kind of point to this complex post-crystallization history of these arsenopyrite crystals. Um, here's a, this example I, as, is particularly striking. Here we have an ars, a giant arsenopyrite crystal. I could see that they are overgro there are other overgrowths of arsenopyrite. And when we look at the trace element chemistry, certainly the, the overgrowths are chemically different. The other fascinating thing about these samples is the, the complex fracture history that we can actually see. So in this case, um, these horizontal lines are actually, they're real, they're not, an, they're not smearing um, related to our analyses. Um, these are, apparently are gold rich. And what's really interesting is that even after those gold rich fractures, we see lead and bismuth fractures that cross cut that fracture history. So you can start to imagine that if we're gonna start dissolving 300 milligrams of this stuff, we're gonna really, we're looking at very different arsenopyrite generations. <clears throat> um, and yet, some arsenopyrites seem to preserve oscillatory zo growth zoning. So here we have um, an arsenopyrite crystal um, that seems to have um, growth zones, um, and yet there's still these late fractures that seem to cross-cut those growth zones. Um, but I would argue that it's samples like this that would preserve the best ages as opposed to samples that have all these complex overgrowths and, and fractures and things. <clears throat> One of the, so you'll notice that I didn't actually show any rhenium data for those maps, and the reason for that is because there's not very much rhenium. And so in order to calculate, to get enough rhenium to analyze with the laser ablation system, we had to actually use spots. And so in this case, this is all the spot data that I have uh, color-coded to gold. Um, and so gold is hot, and gold poor samples are yellow. 
And so what this al allows you to do is quickly see what gold is associated with. So for instance, the, a lot of the orange lines are lead and silver rich. So are, apparently the gold rich samples are also rich in lead and silver. But I'm gonna draw your attention to the far axis here where it says rhenium. And what you can see is that the yellow lines, the most rhenium uh, rich samples are actually the most gold poor. So the orange stuff is towards the bottom. I can't actually point to it there. And the, the actual gold uh, poor samples are actually um, are rhenium poor. And so when we took those samples and we uh, dissolved them up, uh, we had the same problem where we could see these kind of long uh, analytical uncertainties related to the difficulties in, in analyzing such low rhenium samples. So we turned to model ages. Um, and you'll see it's, a, it's sort of a similar story to what we saw in Tanzania. They're really complicated. Um, but what I think is important is to look at, if you can't just treat all of this data as one. And so what we've started to do uh, is to look at the analyses that seem to replicate really well. So we take a sample, and if we get the same answer every single time, we have more faith uh, in that age. And so if you look up here, um, we can see that there's about six replicate analyses of sample CL131. Um, and so that gives us good, it sort of gives us an indication that this sample hasn't really seen some of the uh, disturbing effects that these other samples that are not, homo not replicable, uh, not repeatable, uh, so what we seem to be seeing is that uh, there are, there's an arsenopyrite crystallization event at 2.3 GA, and then there are this variable resetting or, or new arsenopyrite growth towards 1.85, which is the age of the xenotime. And so in our model, what we're suggesting is that these arsenopyrite crystals are actually much older than the xenotime, and that the gold and the monazite were actually remobilized into these low strain microarchitectural sites at 1.85. <clears throat> and so what we tried to do also is kind of look at these samples and use the laser ablation system again, but this time um, look at lead isotopes. Um, and so the benefit of using the laser ablation system is that we can target specific, mic uh, specific uh, textures. And so in this case, we have a pyrite crystal that seems to be, uh, has a pressure shadow filled with pyrotite. So that's a pyrite crystal with a pressure shadow pyrotite. And what we get when we analyze both um, textures is a model, uh, Galena model ages ranging from 2.5 to 1.85. And so how we're interpreting these ages is basically these older model ages are related to the Archean host rocks and that we get this spread towards 1.85 related to the composition of the hydrothermal fluid at 1.85 GA. And so what we think these samples are recording are variable reworking. And so this is of interest because if you're looking in this area, what you want, if you're interested in gold deposits, are these uh, younger uh, model ages. So if you were going around sampling py pyrite, you would, if you got the 2.5, 2.7 pyrite, that probably would tell you that it didn't interact with these younger fluids. So, as I kind of mentioned, the, when we started this project as part of TGI-4, the, all of the gold deposits were thought to be related to the trans-Hudson origin at 1.85. And so at 1.85, this is what the metamorphic uh, history looked like. It affected basically all of the Western Churchill province. But with these new 2.3 ages, we think we can look through this metamorphic overprint and actually go um, and see uh, what the metamorphic, uh, what was happening at 2.3. Um, we could see that the, the snowbird orogeny, which is shown here as along this uh, one of these sh major shear zones cutting the Western Churchill province. Melidine, I can't really point to it. It's down, um, can't, uh, it's, it's actually the string of gold deposits just south. It's actually not, met it doesn't appear to be metamorphosed at 2.3, but the ages that we've got seem to suggest that there is a 2.3 GA history there. And so I think what all of this shows is um, the need to integrate multiple techniques to start unraveling these, history, these hydrothermal histories. And so it's actually really complicated. So even when you can see the relationship, so here in this case we've got a, a really tightly folded quartz vein, the gold is associated with that, that tightly folded quartz vein, but then we've got this late fracture filled with pyrotite, which could also have introduced gold. And so even when we see these relationships, we need to integrate all of these isotopic techniques to sort of unravel when gold was introduced as opposed to when it was remobilized. And I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.